Hakadosh Boker Or Bekim Balacha Day Twenty Three Halacha Gimel Sixty Eight Ken Amud Shishim Veshmone Shchad Ze Birkot Torah Many Achronim ruled that the obligation to recite the Torah blessings over the Mitzvah Torah is mandated by the Torah, which means it's Mina Torah, right? Since the Torah, since the Gemara learns it from the pasuk Kishem Hashem Akrav Ugodol Eloin, we already learned this. The Rambam the Shulchan Aruch, however, ruled that the obligation is Midrabanan. Remember, we said it was a machlok between the Ramban and the Rambam, right? You had the Ramban Nachmanides and Maimonides. Okay, so the Rambam and the Shulchan Aruch say that it's going to be the Rabbanan, Rabbanan. and this is the Halakha in practice, as explained in the, the preface of the Siman. Therefore, if someone cannot remember whether he said it or not, he does not recite it. He may recite the blessing without Hashem's name, obviously. Alternatively, he could ask another person who has who could say it, and he could say it, you know, Lotsi Otodi Makes sense, correct? Okay. Another option is for the person to recite Shachli prayers and have in mind the Brachava, the Pulam. You remember we always said, that it's a problem. We learned this in Birkata, Birkata Shachar, that if a person already said, Birkata, if he already said Amida, for example, mm -hmm. and he says, Mechaya Metim, he can't say the Berakha, and if he said, Avat Olam, which is the Berakha right before Ketchma, he cannot say Birkata Torah. So according to this, let's say a person forgot whether he said Birkata Torah or not, what can he do? He could either come and say it without Shem Malchut, he could ask somebody else to say it for him, plus, we yachol lechaven be'avat Olam. So it's going to be you and Tzadok Hulah. What's the Maybe it's not even in Tzadok Hulah. It's not even in Or Talui. If you hold it, it's the right or not. It's a whole question. Again, if you... If you want No, because one more time. If you're going to tell me that, why would you have to do it again? Only according to the Shita, the Mitzvot, that it's Doraita. If it's Doraita, Mitzvot Shifo Kavana be Doraita. If it's the Rabbanan, that could be something else. But here's Doraita. Okay, it's fine. 61. This was already explained in the preface, right in the Siman. Okay, next halacha. Number four. It is forbidden to study Torah each day until one does the Birkota Mitzvot, Birkota Torah, on the Mitzvah. Nevertheless, if for some reason it's impossible for someone to say the Bracha, he can't study Torah without saying. So 62 on the bottom. The response of Betzalah Chuchmah, right? He stated that it's not actually forbidden to study Torah without saying the Brachot. There's a Mitzvah to say the Brachot. But if someone does not know how to say them, he could study Torah without saying them. This is no different than any other mitzvah, right? That we have to make a bracha, but uh, if you don't... For example, you have to make a bracha on the lulav. Let's say you don't know how to do brachot. You're not going to do the lulav. Obviously, you're going to do the lulav, even though you don't know how to say the bracha. So the same thing, right? You don't know how to say the birkot Torah. So you want to learn. Now again, because obviously we're not talking about Hebrew, because if not, then why can't you do the bracha? Obviously, we're talking about that you don't know Hebrew at all, and you're taking in English, and let's say you don't have a... A phonetic, uh, I don't know what to say, the Birkot Torah, you don't know how to do it, so therefore, you want to learn Torah, so we're not going to tell you not to. The Rishon Etziondo pointed out in contrast that it is clear for many Achronim that it's a sur, unless you said the Brachot. For example, Rav Chaim Volozhin, right, uh, he cited the Gaum Vilna, mm -hmm. right, that he says on uh, on the Sifra, on the Sifra that's Niuta, it's okay, this is on the Zohar. Oh, one second, one second, yeah, yeah. He says that this likewise is a ruling of Rav Naftali Tzvi Yehuda Berlin, right? The Rav Chida, right? And in the glossary, including the new, new edition of Yom, and the Rishon Etzion added, also Rav Shimon Greenfeld, right? That he's with the response of Ken Le David, and the author of the Chazunish. So for the, he added on other people as well, that all of them said, no, it's Mamash, it's an Isur to learn before uh, uh, Birkat Torah. Okay? Now, number 23, though, says that if for some reason it's impossible, then you could still learn. This is the ruling of Shomzam and Arbach. We have no opinion. Yes, you have tons of opinions saying that it's forbidden to do it before. And however, though, if there's a reason, so then it's going to be permitted, which that's for Shomzam and Arbach. He explained that our Chachamin never proclaimed that it's forbidden to perform necessary for uh, right, uh, a mitzvah without first saying a bracha. They only added additional mitzvah of saying a bracha beforehand. And again, this is in contrast to the brachot before eating and drinking. So in that case, they emphatically declared but anyone who eats and drinks without saying a bracha, you're, you're stealing. Correct? If a person comes and he eats without a bracha, he's stealing from Knesset so, Yisrael. It's a gemara, right? So even if the lacha forbids studying Torah without first making the bracha, that lacha only applies when somebody is capable of doing the bracha. But if he cannot do it, so he should still learn. And it's comparable to an onen, right? That he's allowed to eat even without making brachot, right? Since it's forbidden for him to, to do the brachot. And Rav Oyerbach's first argument, it seems, contradicts Rav Shlomo Lulia. But if someone does a mitzvah, such as eating a meal in a sukkah without the blessing, right, he's guilty of committing a grievous sin. 
right? See more, okay, this is a whole Birkat Mazon, the Kavanah, and all these things. But Gorbach's second argument is solid, however, and the Rishon Tzion actually supported them. I mean, the first one was basically, what happens, for for example, if a person is going to come and do a mitzvah, eating in a sukkah, without doing the, the Biracha, right? So therefore, what happens? So at the end of the day, it's still going to be okay. And that's what we're doing here, with what we're saying here. Again, Lecha Techila, obviously, that was the first part of the Halacha. The first part of the Halacha is, it's a sur la'asok bedivre Torah kodim shivarech. It's a sur. That's a lacha. Don't just tell me, listen, it's a bracha. If I don't want to do a bracha, I can still do it. Right? I take the lulav. If I do that, it's a sur. It's not a sur. I just didn't do a bracha. No, 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 no. Here it's a sur lilmod ifne levarech. And that's what the first uh, 62 was. Showing you that against the betzela chukma, that rovad yadre, mamash it's an isur. Okay? The next halacha though is, not only that, it, okay, fine. It's a sur, it's a sur. But what happens if a person can't make a bracha? Whatever the case was, he doesn't know. Whatever, yeah. Let's say, let's just say he doesn't know. So therefore, in such a case, he should still he's still allowed to learn Torah, right? Even before, okay. Halacha number five, okay. Birkat Torah when these blessings are needed. So we must say Birkat Torah whether we wish to study right Tanakh, Mishnah, Talmud, or Midrash, meaning Kol Chelkei Torah, and also the same thing for Zohar and Kabbalah. So the minute, Altach Shobi Glash is a Shama Lamala, yeah, Lotzerik Birkat Torah. Birkat Torah Tzerik Halakul. On everything. Okay, makes sense. Didn't say anything before. Yeah, oh, oh, oh. Let's see, let's see, let's see. Usually it's actually brought down, there's an Isha on it. Let me see here. Midrash, Hebrew alphabet, Hebrew grammar, medicine of the sciences. And very interesting. Okay, we're going to see. We're going to see. I'm yeah. not sure if he's going to. I'm going to read Torah. Kotev Divre Torah. Okay, we're going to. I think if we're, if we're not going to see it, we'll see it somewhere else. I'll, I'll show it to you. But the Tilim is actually brought down. Okay, fine. 64. Okay. The Talmud. Okay, the Gemara Mesech Berachot displays several opinions regarding the subject. Ravuna says that it's going to be obligated for Tanakh, but not Midrash. Rabbi Lazar. Says for Tanakh, not Midrash. Since the Midrash involves the interpretation of the Psukim. This includes Mechilta, Sifra, Sifri. Okay. Uh, the blessings are not unnecessary for Mishnah study, according to Rabbi Lazar. Rabbi Yochanan says that they're necessary for Mishnah as well, but not for Gemara. Rav, Rav says even for Gemara. The Rambam ruled that they are obligated whether the person wishes to study Torah Shavikhtav or Torah Shavikhtav, following the final opinion of Rava. That means we, we many times that happens, we have many different opinions in the Gemara. We go to the last opinion. The last opinion was that even for this, you still need it. So even if, that means for everything. Because the first one said, Mikra lo Midrash. Midrash lo Mikra. No, you need everything. So that's what we go by. Okay? Following the opinion, this is likewise the ruling of the Shulchan Aruch. The Ramah added that the blessings are necessary for Midrash as well. And it's not clear why the Maran omitted Midrash from the list. Despite the omission, the Prikhadar says that the Mishabura, right, um, that also Maran agrees with the Ramah. Meaning he wasn't trying to take out of that. Whatever, I don't know, he just skipped out Midrash. But technically speaking, also you need for Midrash. What about Zohar and Kabbalah? Because that was not brought down in the Gemara. The Gemara did not speak about Zohar and Kabbalah. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, even Rava, that he included Gemara in, in Mishnah, but he didn't speak about Zohar and Kabbalah. Baruch HaShukhan Epsi wrote that it is unclear whether one has to say it right before studying Agadah, Midrash Rabbah, or Kabbalah. Because remember, everything that we mentioned until now, we usually whenever it's written Mishnayot or Gemara, it's usually Psak Alacha. Because the Mishnayot, and they go, what about Agadta? And yeah. Yaakov, Agadta. Agadta is like Agadot. Agadot is like ah, stories. Yeah. So Agadta, that's what it's called. Or for example, you know, En Yaakov, En Yaakov is Agadta. You take all the stories of the Shas, and you have, or you have Midrash Rabbah, Midrashim, or Kabbalah. So citing Rabbi Yunas commentary to Brachot, he demonstrated that the blessings are necessary before studying Mishnah, since it's the basis of Halakha, and before studying Talmud, because that's how the Halakha derives der der from the Pasuk. <laughs> so therefore, we also must say before studying the Midrash, since the Midrash uses the 13 tools in deriving the halacha, such as Kavachomek, Zerah Shavah, but all these areas of Torah are connected to halacha. What about Agadah and Kabbalah? Agadah and Kabbalah has nothing to do with the halacha, so therefore maybe you don't need it. But it is also possible that the Talmud's premise is that Mishnah, Talmud, and Midrash are all part of the Torah given at Har Sinai. So Roshob Zalman actually explained, Arav Zalman, sorry, as Arav Zalman explained, or that the blessings are necessary for any subject that is called Torah, as Levush explained. So according to this, uh, halacha, dif, dif, obviously everything is included in it, right? And therefore, the Ruch HaShulchan do not come to, to any clear ruling, right? But again, obviously, if the Levush and everything, the Kabachim Sofen, on the other hand, 
rule that there's no question that has one has to say it also for Zohar and Kabbalah. He did not offer any explanation for his ruling. Rav Zalman ruled, okay, that the study of Kabbalah is considered an aspect of the, of the study of the Torah or Talmud. He wanted to say that's the exact same thing. What's the difference between Talmud, Talmud and Zohar? It's like the same thing. No, no, Talmud. Talmud, but Zohar is the Zohar. Kabbalah is usually the the works of the Rizal Kadosh and all the other things, but it's not Zohar. Zohar is Zohar. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. The Midrash, although the Rucha Shulchan wrote that he was not sure whether the blessings are necessary before studying Agadah, right? The Rav Zalman also ruled that Agadah, such as Midrash Shabbat, is considered equal to the study of Mishnah, since it's likewise expounding the 613 mitzvot of the Torah. So same thing, it's explaining the Torah. So, what about Musar and Chassidut? What? So you, you have to say no. Yeah, yeah, you have to say. You have to say. What about now Musar and Chassidut? Because Musar and Chassidut is not really using the 13, you know, it's not Halakha, it's not... So, so what about Musar? Musar, or Chassidut. The Mekor Chaim, right? Batra, she says that it is, it is necessary to say Berikat Torah also for other things as well, just like Musar, because they contain Psukim, right, from the Gemara. His Ketruvot also added that this applies to the study of Chassidut, right? It should be noted that sometimes, and especially in our age, a volume that is spiritually inspiring might not cite any verses or passages from our sages. So, you know, sometimes you have to actually be careful, because nowadays it could be that it doesn't have any psukim. You know what I'm It doesn't bring anything. But, so a person has to, you know, but again, but the concept there is, is there. Vignette about Sadiqim. What about different stories about Sadiqim and things like that? So it says, the Psket Shuvot says that it's not necessary to say Mikat Torah for a story about a great Torah leader. Even if the story inspires people to improve their manners, right, or their, you know, Avodat Hashem or things like that, Talakha is different if the story includes references to Talakha or explanations on a pasuk. And even just stama, if it's stama story, you don't need it. But if if according if in the story you have an explanation of pasuk or you have uh, or you have you know halacha or something that he was doing, then again you would be obligated. But if not, then sipuret tzadikim lo tzadich. Okay. What about Hebrew alphabet? So he says the response to Chuba Benagot discussed the question, right? What about um, of the need for reciting Bikat Torah in order to learn the Hebrew alphabet? Is the knowledge of recognizing the letters considered enough or not? So for example. Right, you have, uh, okay, usually you have little children coming inside. But let's say you have an adult. So an adult comes, I'm going to teach you alphabet. You see me cut the Torah. I'm only teaching you alphabet. I'm not teaching you Torah. I'm teaching the alphabet. So he says, he explained that the characters of the Hebrew are not arbitrary symbols, like the letters of other alphabets. Each letter and the fact that each part of the letter represents numerous, numerous Kabbalistic secrets. And the Mitzvah of Torah study began with the learning to recognize the letters and engraved on the Shnei of the Brit. So learning to distinguish a letter is actually the Torah, and therefore, even if it was not an actual Torah study, since it's a basic skill necessary for Torah study, it is like Torah study. Okay, so many people, however, do not have any understanding of this, and they think that learning how to read the letters is no more than learning a skill to enable like to learn a language. If this is how really people think, then they would not recite the Berakha. Their study of the letters is just like, uh, you know, reciting prayer that happens to include some Pesukim, but they didn't even understand what they're doing. You understand? So it all depends on the person. If a person in Lumi bin Krum, and he thinks, okay, I'm learning an alphabet, so, okay, so you're right, don't make a Berikat Torah. But if he understands that every single letter, that the way that it is, why is it this way, why is this, this like that, 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 so the world in itself, so therefore it's obviously it's going to be different. Letter is very holy. 100%. So the response concludes by ruling that the proper thing to do is to say the Berakha of Yikata Torah, right, even before studying letters, unless if a student comes over and asks someone who has not said the Berakha, and the person may answer him, he could answer and have a mind not to fool the Mitzvah of Torah study with the answer. If somebody comes, what letter is this? Aleph. I didn't say we cut the Torah. Okay, just don't have a mind that you're studying. You could just answer him Aleph and that's it. What about Dikduk? Yeah? Ata Yeah. Okay. The response is Shailat Ya'abet. Right? Sayyid and Misham Bura ruled that it's from the study Hebrew grammar while in the, in the toilet. Since it's impossible to avoid thinking about Psukim in the Torah, and apparently if it's not for this problem, it would be permissible. We can deduce from this that Torah study, the grammar, is not considered by right, Torah study. Why? Because if the only sur was because of the psukim, so it's mashma that it's not Torah. So it comes out that the dituk is not Torah. Right? One second. The responsa, right? Salmat Chaim Zanenfeld, however, ruled the classic text of Hebrew grammar, which were composed by great Tabidei Chachamim, and are necessary for the Torah, are considered Torah texts. The modern grammar text, whose purpose is to teach students how to write proper prose, is not considered. So meaning like this. If it's a dikduk of today, that they teach you how to write something, it's not. 
but even Sifre Digduk, the Gaon, the Gaon has a book on Digduk, by the Gaon, you know, the Radak, you know, all these uh, big, uh, about huge uh, Gdolim, you know what I'm saying? So then that's considered to us. Okay? So it appears from this that when someone studies Hebrew grammar for the purpose of increasing his understanding in Torah text, he already fulfills the mitzvah of Torah study and he needs to recite the verse we cut to Torah. According to the Yavetz, however, the pure study of Hebrew grammar in itself is not Torah study. Perhaps there's no contradiction. The Yavetz was talking about a case where someone studies grammar as if it was a secular subject. But he ruled that even so, it's forbidden to study in the restroom, right? Because of the psukim. And Samad Chaim is talking about that he's studying grammar in order to enhance the Torah knowledge. Because many times you don't understand how many times that you learn Dikduk and it changes everything. You understand? Like it changes the entire way of how you're learning, what you're learning, right? I still remember until today I have a, I had a Rebbe in grade 12 and he taught us Dikduk. And when he taught us Dikduk, he used to teach grade 4, grade 4, grade 3, Sumash. And he used to teach like the Hebrew studies. And he always used to teach in Parashat Yitro. He said in within the first, I don't remember how many psukim of Yitro, the first few aliyot, he says the majority is, a, a lot of it is all the do. This week's parasha, pay attention. Start reading. Shiber. How did he break the luchot? You know, in parasha kitisa. Shiber, shabar, you know, shubar. All those things depends. What does that mean? Did he break it with a lot of strength? Did he just drop it? Did he... All those things depend upon the one word. So many times it depends upon one word and it could change the entire meaning of what exactly is going on. So everybody is very, very important, obviously. Fine. Medicine and other studies, and this is the last one, in light of the above discussion, if someone studies geometry for the express purpose of understanding Alachot of Sukkah, Eruv and Kilain, right, that calls for this knowledge, he will be credited for these studies if he is pure studied Torah. Wow. Okay? The same applies to a Torah scholar who studies medicine in order to decide which people have to fast on Kippur or not. To someone who studies astronomy to go to the Hebrew calendar or genetics in order to help people with fertility treatments. Right? Maran, Maran the Rishon Letzion studied the mechanics of hot water boiled in order to rule about using household hot water on Shabbat. All these efforts are considered a facet of Torah study in itself. It is unclear, however, whether it becomes necessary to say we cut the Torah or not. So me, incredible, meaning that you could have a, a rabbi that he's a, he's a rabbi in fertility. He's a rabbi in all these things. It's all considered Torah for him. Why? Because since he was studying it in order to be psak on these things, so it's considered Torah. Now, do you have to say we cut the Torah or not? That's not that clear. Because at the end of the day, it in itself is not Torah. But it's still considered Torah study because it was necessary for the Torah. The famed well, doctor of Shkulov, Arav Baruch Shik, cited Arav Eliyahu Vivilna, claiming that if someone is ignorant of the prior sciences, he will miss a hundredfold more of understanding of the Torah. The Torah's wisdom is intertwined with all other wisdoms. See more about this in Otsrot Agra. The Maharal of Prague also wrote that the natural sciences are the first stage of divine wisdom. And without it, you cannot actually climb the ladder of Torah wisdom. We know that the Gaon of Vienna wrote a, wrote a math book in the toilet. Huh? In the toilet, he wrote a math book. Meaning that we're talking about people that, why? Because they have to know everything. Because even math and even all these things. If you don't know math, you don't understand sukkah to do with the pie and all those things. and the and You don't understand. There's so many things in Eruvin and in the other. You have to know. Whether it's math, whether it's science, whether it's all these things. You have to know. Like today we talk about the Tesla, the, the... You have to know, you have to go deep into it to understand how does it work in order to know what, what it is. Is it Isu Duraita, Isu Durabanan? How would you do it? Right? Like you have a Tesla, you know, maybe you should better to you have you have a Tesla in a regular car. Somebody has to drive them to the hospital. Maybe it's better to take the Tesla. So it could be a Sud Rabanan. You understand? So again, you know, it's there. Despite these testimonies, other areas of wisdom cannot be categorized of Torah itself. They are background. Right, they are background information that takes uh, uh, that take that make it possible to comprehend the Torah. The Rambam, for example, described the study of sciences by right, referring to them as maid servants, cooks, and chefs for the Torah, who is the mistress. Meaning, the Torah was the mistress; she was the the Adon, she was the master. But all the science and medicine was all the chefs, the cooks, and everything just to serve the Torah. Therefore, after reciting the Berachah of the Torah. One must make sure to recite the Berachot, the Berachot of the Kohanim before continuing with the study of sciences. And you don't start, say, Mikat the Torah and study science. Say, Mikat the Torah, say, Mikat Kohanim, and then you're going to study science. You can do whatever you want. Okay, have a wonderful day.